Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Diana Sanchez, and I'm with the TCU Alumni Association. I'm here with my colleague, Taryn Sood from the Career Center, um, and Hallie, which will be hosting our webinar. Uh, I'm so excited to have you all join us. Uh, we're gonna give a couple minutes uh, for everyone to get logged in before we get started with our special guest, Hallie Crawford. We'll talk to us about five ways to conduct successful informational interviews. Um, so we'll wait a little bit and then we'll get started. Sounds good. And Diana, will you start the recording for us too? I don't need to do that, right? Oh no, I think it should have started. Oh, did yeah. I oh awesome. Okay, cool. Just I just wanted to make sure it wasn't me supposed to be doing something. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Diana Sanchez with TCU Alumni Association. Um, I'm here with my colleague Terrence and Hallie. Um, I'll allow my colleague Terrence to, to introduce himself before we turn it over to Hallie. Uh, Terrence? Hi, everyone. I'm Terrence Hood, and I'm, I'm with the Center for Career Professional Development, and I serve as the Associate Director for Alumni Career Services. So. We help all TCU alumni with job searching, networking, interview prep, LinkedIn. So alumni have lifetime access to our services at no cost. So you can make appointments through Handshake to meet with the Career Center. Alumni have access to all of our services at no cost. So we appreciate you all being here and we look forward to our conversation with Hallie. So Hallie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us again. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure, thoroughly enjoy it. And I'm excited to talk about informational interviews because I find, and our coaches find, that it's one of the most underutilized tools in people's job search and their career exploration. Informational interviews can be used for a lot of different reasons. And I think even more so these days as we move towards leveraging technology and there's all these different things technology-wise with job searching, we tend to forget, I think, that that human connection is still, and that networking thing is still how most people get jobs. That's still the best way to find a new position. So it's even more important, I think, these days. So just really quickly, by way of introduction, I'm a certified career coach, speaker, and author. Um, I am based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we have coaches across the country. I've been coaching and training since 2002, so it's been a long time in a good way because we love what we do, um, I as well, I do as well. And I have an undergraduate degree from Vanderbilt University and a master's degree from the University of Illinois. And the advice that we're going to give you today, we're going to be try to be as tangible, practical, real um, as we can with action steps to help you conduct more effective informational interviews in whatever way you end up doing so, whether it's in person, over the phone, video, et cetera, even at networking events. And what I wanted to say just really quickly before we dive in is we'll give you a lot of different tips and tools and advice. And what I would suggest is because of that, so that you don't get overwhelmed, pick and choose what makes the most sense for you. Where are the areas that you may need to improve the most with your informational interviews or meetings? Is it putting yourself out there a little bit more? Is it preparing more, finding connections, et cetera, et cetera? So pick and choose what makes the most sense for you based on your situation, personality type, et cetera. And as a quick reminder, just a couple of quick admin items, we are recording today. You will receive a copy of the recording automatically. If you would also like to receive a copy of the slides, you can email us at admin at createyourcareerpath.com. Happy to provide those to you um, and we'll email those over to you. And then um, also we are gonna have Q&A at the end. 
and I'll go through our agenda in here just in just a second. But I wanted to say as well that if you do have questions, comments or resources or something that you would like to share at any time during the webinar, please feel free to do that. I have the Q&A box and the, the webinar chat box open and I will field questions as they come through as needed too. So don't feel like you have to hold everything to the end. We can answer along the way as well. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. What is an informational interview? What does it mean? How have things changed um, post COVID, et cetera, et cetera? The obstacles that people tend to encounter when they're conducting them and maybe not conducting them quite as effectively as they could. We'll give you those five tips and tools to be more effective with them. And then as I said a second ago, we'll have time for Q&A at the end as well. So let's dive in. We all know job searching can be stressful. I don't think that in the 25 or so years that I've been coaching, I've heard anyone say, I love searching for a new job. It's not most people's favorite thing to do. So you're not alone, it's normal. And what we find people will tell us is things that are listed on this slide, plus some other things too, that some people feel like they're uncertain how to handle their search. Where do I spend the majority of my time? What do I say to people when I first reach out to them? What if they ignore me? How do I deal with that? How do I network effectively in a virtual format versus just in person? And as we said earlier though, even though this may not be, especially those of you who are more introverted like I am, it may not be your favorite thing, this networking concept and idea, it is still a really important tool for your job search and outside of that as well. So here's what we're talking about in terms of an informational interview. Most of you probably know at least the basics of what it is, but we wanted to tack on a few things here. So if you look at this next slide at the bottom left-hand side, usually an informational interview or meeting, you could use either term, that's fine, is a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who is in an industry, a role, or even at an organization that you are interested in. It could be that you're interested in getting a job there, okay? And we all get that, but we don't wanna go up front asking for people to get us a job. That's not the goal of this, this is to ask for information. So the kind of three criteria, if you will, when you're looking for people to have a conversation with is they could be in the industry that you are either in now and want to stay in a new industry that maybe you're wanting to transition into. It could be that they're in a role that you'd like to pursue and they could give you really good insight about what that job is like and what the requirements are, et cetera, et cetera. Or it could be an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about a specific organization that you would like to get your foot in the door to. And obviously that's what we're going for at the end of the day, because we're looking for those connections at places that they will keep us in mind when or if a job opening comes up. Now let's look at the right side of this slide. There's actually multiple different reasons to conduct these um, meetings with people. They can be more formal or um, less formal just by the way too. And we'll talk about that as we progress. But some of the reasons outside of even job searching that you might wanna conduct a conversation or have a conversation with someone is to help you brainstorm career ideas. If you're looking to change direction and you need some help, you wanna learn a little bit more about what a specific career path is like, it can help you decide on that or determine your next career steps and maybe get some ideas about how to implement those things. For job seekers, it can be a way to network your way into an organization, an industry, et cetera. It's also a good opportunity though, to help you practice your interview skills in a lower pressure environment because we want you to take these conversations seriously and act as if it's an interview. You're putting your best foot forward, you're dressing professionally, et cetera. It's a good way to practice those skills and how you're presenting yourself. And then finally, it's a great way to learn how to put your best foot forward in your search. So with these people that you are talking to over time, that's one of the questions that you can even ask them is say, you know, what are some of the job search tools that you have used? Do you know any um, recruiters that you would recommend or have worked with before? Do you happen to have any advice about how I can put my best foot forward in my search? 
Um, are there keywords I should be adding to my resume specifically for the type of role that you're in? So it's information gathering and it's good information gathering because they're going to give you really good, accurate advice. And then the goal at the end of the day, obviously, is that you get some good advice, you get some resources, hopefully, too. And ideally, they will keep you in mind if a role comes up that they hear about and also that they make an introduction to someone else for you, too, that could be helpful for you along the way. Let's take a look at these next couple of slides. What an informational interview is, is it's an opportunity to find out what it's really like to work in that particular job and field, kind of like we talked about a second ago, and find out about any career opportunities that may exist at that organization or with other organizations, maybe where they know someone else or have a friend. It can help you in some cases, you can leverage them to help you get the inside perspective on what it's like to work at a certain organization before you accept a job. That is one way that some people will leverage these types of meetings. Another reason or what it is, so to speak, is it's a way, obviously, for you to make a connection in that industry and begin to expand your network in that field. It's another way to find other people to network with. And like we said, practice your interview skills with less pressure. And I'll say one thing, and then we'll go to this next slide as we're talking about this. So we have had clients have great success with informational meetings overall. But we also know that realistically, there are plenty of people that may not respond to you or may say no. So when you're thinking about reaching out to people, we want you to think about this process almost as like a law of numbers, or it's almost like sales. The more people that you contact and reach out to and try to set up time with, the more people you'll be able to get actual time with. If you get a 10 or 20% return rate, you're in good shape. We've had clients though, for example, who asked a, a second connection in between them and a third connection that they had. You know, would you mind making an introduction to this person who works at XYZ company? I'd love to talk with them a little bit more because I'm gonna apply there um, in the next couple of days. They got a meeting with that person and that person was fantastic. They were willing to actually walk their resume down to the HR department or email it, whatever they did. But the point is that once you start to find people that are helpful, they enjoy networking, um, they get how this process works, it's going to help you get the ball rolling so much faster with your job search. So a couple of things that an informational interview is not is that you don't want to take too much of their time. You want to you know, have an established timeline for how long they can meet with you, whether it's phone, video, in person, in advance and stick to that timeline. And you want to make sure that you've got questions prepared, that you use that time wisely. This is not a, hey, I just wanted to talk with you for a few minutes to find out more about your career progression. That's too vague and is not buttoned up enough. You want to show them that you can present yourself effectively. You're not going to ramble on and talk too much. You've got specific questions prepared in advance, and you're conducting it like a professional meeting. The second thing that an informational interview is not, is not a time to ask for a job right then and there. Now, what I'll say about this, and then Diana, if we could go ahead and launch this first poll here, we can have people start to fill that out. That would be great. Um, what you want to be mindful of here is if the conversation is going in the direction of there is a job opening there, or you know there is, it's okay to ask them for advice about, you know, I've already applied for this job. Do you have any suggestions or advice um, about how to best follow up? Or if they bring up there are open positions there, it's okay to say, you know, would you, do you think I would be qualified for those? And would you mind passing my resume along? So if it comes up in the conversation, it is okay to discuss it, but it's not something where you sit down with them and say, okay, I want a job. Can you help me? You just need to conduct it in the right way. And then finally, this is not a time to be overly casual about your goals, et cetera. We want you to err on the side of being more formal and professional. And as the conversation goes, you can ease off a little bit, but the idea is that you want to make a good impression so that when they 
hear about a job opening, they feel confident or good about at the very least, like passing along your resume or mentioning you to that person, et cetera. So you do not want to slack off with this and not be prepared, et cetera. It is a professional meeting and you want to treat it as such. All right. So we opened up our panel. I know already, I mean, our poll, sorry, already. And we'll take a look at the results here. This is actually, I'm thrilled that the results is 50-50 or they are 50-50. I have found over the past year or so that more and more people are conducting these effectively. So kudos to you. And for those people who haven't, it's totally okay. That's why you're here today. Um, we'll help you give, get some advice on how to get the ball rolling with it, okay? So I said this a little bit earlier, if we look at the next slide, we find that it's one of the most underutilized tools in people's job search. People tend to avoid it. It's not their favorite thing. It takes more time and effort. Um, than just applying for jobs online. That's more satisfying and rewarding in a way. Like I applied for 10 jobs today. Okay, cool. I get that. And please know that these are still something that people do. They conduct these frequently and it's still a good idea to do so. We had a client once, she was actually very um, senior level um, in the C-suite at um, a large construction firm here in Atlanta. And she conducted an informational interview with someone at Kimberly Clark, basically at her same level. And my point is, regardless of where you are in your career and at your level, these are still a valid tool. After they finished their time together talking, the woman at Kimberly Clark said, you know, thank you for setting up this time. This was fantastic. Um, and she was the one, you know, being interviewed and said, not enough people do these kinds of things these days. So this face-to-face -face video, phone, whatever it is, not just solely email and texting can make a really big difference in your job search. And what our clients tell us is that nine times out of 10, <coughs> in terms of their career goals, job search goals included, that they tend to be their biggest obstacle. They avoid doing these things. They're not conducting them as effectively as, as they could, et cetera. So just know that in some cases, we kind of need to get out of our own way in order to push ourselves to do these. Now, I know that some people have negative assumptions about them, and we've kind of alluded to that a little bit already today. Here's what we find with our clients that they'll say, oh, I don't want to do it or I haven't done it. They're only for young people. Well, I gave you the example of the C-suite level just a moment ago. Absolutely not the case there. Some people, if they're more introverted than extroverted, I totally get it because I'm actually 60% um, introverted and 40% extroverted. So my kind of running joke is I can pose as an extrovert when I need to. But networking is not always the first thing that I want to do either. I get that. And if you are more introverted, and this is one of the difficulties that you have with your job search, a really good book that we like, it's listed on the right-hand side here of the slide. It's called The Introvert Advantage, and the author is there too. We find this is really helpful for our introverted clients to help them find a way to network effectively, but do so in a way that they still feel like they can be themselves. They're not trying to you know, be someone else, so to speak. And some people, I get it, don't wanna ask for help. They don't wanna look like they don't know what they're talking about. We need to push these aside as much as possible. And here's what we find, and then I'll talk about this next slide, is that once you get the ball rolling with these, you'll start to feel more comfortable over time. You'll get more comfortable knowing and understanding what types of questions to ask because you'll have had that practice. You'll start to narrow down your questions over time to more focused things because you've covered the general stuff at the beginning and you'll just get more comfortable with this. I'll tell you that the clients that we work with who are more senior in their career, meaning they're older, and I can say that because I'm 51, it's not like I'm 20, um, they just naturally kind of network and do these types of things. They just pick up the phone and call someone or, you know, ask for an introduction. For them, it's almost like second nature. And this is for the people here today that may be a little bit younger. Um, it's to get in that mode of conducting these more and it will start to seem and become a lot easier. Here's the deal. The statistic on the slide is still true. Now, I get that with the different job boards out there, with LinkedIn and employers and recruiters using LinkedIn to find candidates, things are changing slowly. Yes, 
but this still is accurate that most jobs are secured through the hidden job market, which is those unadvertised positions that you find through a headhunter, through a recruiter, or through networking. We had a guy once, he was in New Jersey, um, looking for a job, and he was talking to a friend and a colleague at a different organization in North Carolina, and they were just having a quick, you know, catch-up conversation. And when he started to talk about his job search, his friend said, oh, well, they're actually looking to let go one of the people in our group, unfortunately for that person. Um, so they will be looking soon. Why don't you send over your resume? You just never know when this is going to come up in conversation. So let's talk next about the ways to conduct these effectively to really close the loop and the deal as much as possible with them. And there's five things that we want you to be doing and walking through each of these steps in order to conduct them successfully, finding the right connections, not just general connections, setting up and preparing in advance, which we always want you to do, conducting them, staying in touch with the person afterwards and staying organized. So let's look first at connections. So as you go through your list of connections on LinkedIn and your phone, et cetera, and we'll talk about this more, but you will discover that some people are going to be more helpful than others, just like we talked about earlier. Some people are going to be more willing to give you more time, some less. Some people are more are better connected than others. And it's okay for you in the back of your mind to be saying to yourself, okay, my top 10 or 12, whatever, really good connections, people who know everybody, we know who those people are in our lives. Those are the main people that I want to be staying in touch with during the course of this process, because they're most likely to be able to help me the most. It could be that some of your other connections are going to be better suited for you because they're, they're willing to really give you more time or they're in the right industry or at the right organization. So the bottom line here is when you are identifying connections and making them, we want you to be strategic about it and keep in mind, and I hate to say it this way, but who the better connections versus the ones that may be a little bit less relevant for you. Now, when we're looking at this first slide, we really want you to think outside the box with who you can connect with. Now, number one on LinkedIn, we want you to get up to um, 500 or more connections. And what this means is that you can start connecting with people who you don't know. You can accept connection requests from people that you don't know necessarily until you get to that number because that number does make a difference on LinkedIn. You get access to more of their resources. They just, they smile on you more with LinkedIn. It helps you with your search more. After that, you can be pickier about your connections and that's fine. But we want you to look at all of these possible groups, friends, family members, social groups, go through your phone <coughs> and literally look through everybody there and connect with as many people as possible on LinkedIn. It's going to expand the possibility of the people that you know you can have second connections with. We also want you to go through the LinkedIn connections that you currently have and check out who they are connected to as well. Who do you have mutual connections with? Because those are possible people that you want to be talking to. So leverage LinkedIn, not just to make new connections and reach out to people, but also to say, okay, who are my second and third connections through these other people too? We absolutely want you to join and participate in and leverage your TCU Alumni Association group, LinkedIn group, any groups that they have. And um, Terrence and Diana, one or the other will tell us more about those later or we'll put them in the chat. This is critical because they are going to be warm leads for you. <clears throat> These are people that are more likely to get back to you, more likely to give you more time, et cetera. And when you're looking within your alumni association, you can be looking for people that work at certain places, have a certain job title, et cetera. Remember the criteria that we gave you before. We also wanna suggest that you look at industry specific networking groups on LinkedIn. And Diana just put it in the chat. Thanks for that, Diana. Make sure you get on hornedfrogsconnect.com. Networking groups on LinkedIn that are industry specific, they can be hit or miss. So here's the deal with these is we encourage you to find like one or two of them to at least join 
and see if there's anyone that you would like to connect with in that group because it is narrowing things down for you a little bit more. And also people who tend to, they seem like they participate in the group a little more because they might be someone who's more willing to spend time networking. Like they get that and they enjoy networking. What we have heard from our clients is in some cases, these groups are really active and in some cases they're not. But part of why I want you to get in them anyway is because of the reasons why I said before, you may generate a couple of really good connections and it's worth it. And we've also had a couple of headhunters and recruiters tell us that when they are looking for someone for a new position, they will go to their LinkedIn industry association group or industry specific group first because it's a narrow pool of people from the get-go for them, okay? Association meetings, so your local industry association, their local chapter, attending those meetings, going to their webinars, connecting with people there, that's really fair game for you too. Those are good connections. And then social groups. We've had clients get interviews from their daycare provider because another parent was an architect, just happened to be, and their company was hiring get connections at a wedding they attended. So I know you've heard it before, networking can happen anywhere, but it's true. It's cliche, but it's true. Now, if we look at the right-hand side here, this is short and sweet, so we'll continue on quickly here, but there are different ways to conduct these meetings. And it's okay, by the way, if the person that you're reaching out to is not able to or not willing to meet you in person, it's nice if they can, that's an, because that face-to-face -face connection can be really positive and good, but it's totally fine if it's over the phone, video, and worst case, if they're like, I can email you some answers to some of the questions, that can be okay too. It's not ideal, but just know that there's different ways to go about this, and that's completely acceptable. The deal is that when you're setting it up and conducting it, you want to make sure that you are making it as easy as possible on them. And so I don't want to say it as like you're running the show, but you kind of are in the sense that you want to ask them up front, how much time um, are you able to give me? Um, I just want to be mindful of our time and you help keep track of time so that you're not taking more of it. You give them your phone number, but you ask for theirs and offer to initiate the call. I will call you then. Don't make them do a bunch of legwork because they are not the person that needs something. You want to offer to buy their lunch, offer to buy them coffee or tea. You um, initiate the call, give them the Zoom link, whatever it is. Unless they offer it up, that's totally fine. Just don't make it harder on them than it needs to be. Let's take a look at this next slide here. Setting it up. Let them know up front that you are looking for information, not a job. And you can literally say, I'd like to ask you three or four questions about my job search and how to put my best foot forward in my search. Just get your advice on a couple of things. That's a fine way to present it. I like it. Number two here on the slide is I'm really impressed when the person sends me four or five questions in advance that they want to cover with me. And I like this because it shows professionalism and preparation on their part. It gives me an opportunity to prepare in advance. So I feel like I'm using the time wisely, but they are also using my time wisely because I want to feel like someone is respecting my time that I'm giving them and that they are serious about this. They're going to use it. And, you know, they've got their act together for lack of a better way to say it. So I really like it once you've set up the time, the meeting, et cetera, if you send them a quick follow-up and say, these are the three or four questions or four or five, depending on how much time you have, that I would like to cover if that's okay with you. Okay, great. And then in the intro, when you're looking to set it up, let them know that you intend to keep it brief. If it's a phone call and you get the sense from them that they're really busy, um, you can say to them, looking for 10 to 15 minutes or 15 to 20 minutes of your time um, to just ask you a couple of quick questions if you don't mind. And as part of this, like we said a second ago, ask them how much time they have when you first meet with them or when you're first getting um, on the phone with them so that you can keep track of the time and are making sure like close to the end, you're saying, I know we're getting close to our time. I want to be respectful of that. If we need to start wrapping up, that's fine. Okay. And I would also 
have a few additional questions ready to go just in case. And I would have your resume ready to go just in case too. If you're meeting with them in person, I would bring it with you in case they ask for it or if the conversation kind of leads in that direction. But I wouldn't just sit down and hand it over to them because that's presumptuous. Have it ready just in case. It's something that you could email them afterwards if needed, et cetera. Just be ready to go with whatever, you know, the direction the conversation goes. Now, how do we set this up? What's a basic kind of email formula? There's an example on the next slide. Um, and as a reminder, if you want the slides, um, it doesn't look like I can chat to everybody. So Diana, if you don't mind just putting the email address in there for the slides, that'd be great. It's admin at createyourcareerpath.com. Um, so the basic way to ask people for time with them, introduce yourself, how you found them, especially whether it's a referral source or name of a person, put that in the subject line of the email, okay? If it's an email, put it at the very beginning of your LinkedIn message. So, because you want them to open the message versus thinking it's spam. So if someone is looking to talk with someone and I referred them, I would have them say in the subject line, referral from Hallie Crawford right there. It could be TCU alum, you know, um, asking for, asking a few questions, something like that. Make sure the subject line is something that they will want to open. No, it's not spam. We like it if you email or message people first versus calling, catching them off guard. Let them know you're wanting informational interview, like we said. And right then and there, include times and days that you're available. Make it easy for them. Don't go back and forth hunting and pecking for times. It's And don't just say, I'm you know available anytime over the next couple of weeks. It's good to say, these are the time slots I have available if any of these happen to work for you. If they do not, please feel free to offer something else. But again, you want to make it easy, get it nailed down as quickly as possible. We said this next one earlier on the slide, if it's phone or video, you initiate the call, et cetera. And be understanding if there's a slower response time from certain people due to if, you know, like they're dealing with layoffs at their company or whatever it is, those types of things. Rule of thumb, and I'm putting up our email template here just so you can take a look at this while we um, continue on. But rule of thumb for follow-up with someone, I would say is if it's a cold lead, I would send them one message. And if I didn't hear back from them, I would send them one more message, like five or six business days after that, give them a little bit of time and space. And then at that point, after a second message, I would just drop it and let it go. However, if you're reaching out to someone who is a referral or it's a warm lead that someone has made an introduction for you, following up two times is reasonable. Same thing I just described. But if they don't get back to you at that point, I would go back to my original connector, the person who introduced us in the first place and say, hey, I didn't hear back from so-and-so yet. Should I just let it go? Do you know if they are on vacation or what would you suggest as the best course of action? Bottom line, don't just let things completely die on the vine and slide. You want to be as assertive as possible without being a pest and a stalker, right? So what I call it is being a professional pest. It's okay to be assertive about your follow-up as long as you're doing it in a professional way kind, thoughtful manner. Okay. But those other things that we just talked about are kind of really critical pieces too. You can go back to the person who introduced you in the first place to ask for additional assistance or thoughts. And if you look at our template here, just really briefly, you know, the alumnus would make sense if you're using Horned Frogs Connect. It would, could be something different if you're in a LinkedIn group or the referral name, or even if it's just a cold reach out, we're connected on LinkedIn or I found you on LinkedIn. Quick little blurb about who you are and background and experience, but not too much. Would love to you know, have some time to talk with you. Here are some times I'm available, et cetera, et cetera. Basics of what we wanna say in an intro um, email, if you will. And there's going to be one thing I want to say about chat GPT and AI here, and I'm going to say it after um, 
we talk about this slide for just a second. So the second thing that you want to do as part of setting this up is that you want to make sure that you're really preparing for the time that you are meeting with this person. And remember, as we said, if after two follow-ups, you haven't heard from someone, you just keep going, go to the next person until you find some people that can meet with you and are willing to do so. But we want you to have some really good, thoughtful questions prepared in advance. There are different types of questions that you might be asking. If you are looking for a new job, it may make sense to have um, some of these questions listed. So for example, what qualifications and experience do I need to have in order to you know, get a job in this field? That can give you clues to what you may need to focus on in an interview. What are the best places to look for a job in this industry? Um, how did you get started? What companies, um, what are companies looking for? So some of these on this slide are gonna be relevant strictly for job search, but some of them are gonna be relevant for what is this kind of job? Like, what is it like? Is this the right job to pursue for me? One of the things you can do is you can ask ChatGPT for good informational interview questions for a product manager type of job, if that's what you're looking for. So get advice and thoughts after you've done some of your own thinking. You, this is where you can leverage ChatGPT in AI to get some additional really good questions that you can ask for your specific situation. And you can do the same thing to help you wordsmith a little bit your ask in the email that we talked about before. What I'll tell you with AI so far with job seekers is it can be really, really helpful to help you prepare for interviews, what qu types of questions might be asked, et cetera. But it's not, it doesn't always know, it might not always have all of the information that you need. And employers are recruit and recruiters are telling us that they can tell when people have just written something from scratch using AI or ChatGPT and they don't like it. So always use it as one of the tools in your toolkit, but don't rely solely on it, bottom line, okay? And as part of your research, if you take a look at this next slide, some of the things that you want to do to prepare for the time with them is you don't wanna go in cold turkey looking like you don't know anything. And you're asking them really basic questions that you could have found out yourself online by either looking at the company website, their social media, job boards, et cetera. So do your homework before you meet with someone about their industry, trends, software, lingo, job titles that you might be looking at. So that again, you're not going to them and saying, I'm looking for a job in this industry. What are some of the job titles I should be looking at? You want to have that prepared in advance. Same thing with researching their company or their organization. Same thing for researching the types of roles. And the interviewer connect with them on LinkedIn in advance if they're willing to do that, if they respond to you and make sure you review their profile so that you're asking them questions too that it's reasonable for them to answer based on their role, their level, seniority, et cetera. And it's also an opportunity to see if there's any common ground that you have, um, connection that you can make that helps the conversation go a little bit more smoothly that things that you can connect on. If you feel like you need more help with your questions and getting really specific with these, we always offer a free consult. It's an opportunity to learn a little bit more about our coaching services, and we do give a discount for TCU alumni. So if you do set this up, it's the same email address. It's in the chat. Same one for the slides. Please mention um, the discount so that I can give you the coupon code for that. This is what we do all day. Happy to help if you feel you need it. Now, as part of conducting, let's move to step number three and actually conducting the meeting in any way, shape or form, arrive early, be on time, make sure, like we said earlier, stick to the time agreed to, make sure you don't go over and are talking too much, dress professionally, and I would err on the side of more professional than less if you're not sure. We talked already about having your resume handy just in case. Make sure that you've got your LinkedIn profile up to date and you connect with them on LinkedIn either before or afterwards. You may even wanna look through their connections if they are open to the public on LinkedIn because it is okay if the meeting has gone well and you know that they're connected with one person at a company that you are dying to work at, for example, it's okay to say, you know, um, I did take a look at LinkedIn and did some homework on LinkedIn a little bit and I noticed that you were connected to someone at 
you know, Amazon, Google, whatever it is, a, a XYZ accounting firm. Um, I don't want to be presumptuous, but would it be possible to maybe have a conversation with that person? And again, you're asking in a nice, kind way not to be too pushy. And if they say no, that's okay. But have your ducks in a row and be prepared because they may have forgotten, for example, that they're connected that, to that person. And it helps you kind of keep the ball rolling. It's okay to have your questions written out um, and a way to take notes, by the way. That's at the end of this slide here. And I just wanted to reference that too. Okay. So at the end of your meeting with them, after you've gone through your questions, you always make sure that you close things out in a professional, positive way. Is there anything that I can help you with at this time? Please don't hesitate to ask if there is something I could help you with at any point in time. Um, ask them, is there anyone else you think it would be helpful for me to talk to? And when you are having this conversation, you want to ask them, would you mind, if they say yes, of course, would you mind sending an email introduction to the both of us or a LinkedIn introduction to the two of you? Because what you want here is there's greater accountability if they include both of you on the message and then you have the person's contact information and can follow up with them, which is what you should be doing. You shouldn't wait for them to follow up with you. It should be the other way around. And then finally, ask them if you think it makes sense to do so based on the tone of the conversation and how it went. Can I stay in touch with you? And what would be the best way to do that? Is it okay if I contact you if I have a few more questions later on? So again, feel out the situation based on how it went, what you think they might say, um, but you wanna have a plan, especially if the person is very engaged in the conversation and seems very willing to help you out of like follow up. What's the best way to do that with you? Make a plan in that way, be direct about it. Step number four is to stay in touch with that person. Immediately on the left-hand side here on the slide, email them a thank you for their time. And I would also recommend writing them a handwritten thank you note if you can get their, um, like their, not their personal email address. Well, if they give you that, okay, or uh, sorry, their um, work mailing address, if it's possible. If it's not, that's okay. Just hunt and peck a little bit to see if you can find it because that can make a really big impression on people. Make sure, like we said already, connect with them on LinkedIn. On the right-hand side of the slide, make sure you follow up with their referrals, any they give you immediately, and keep each person posted along the way. So when you talk with Joanne, you let Susan know that you spoke with her so that Susan knows that you followed up on her you know, advice and suggestion and that referral. Okay, so keep them posted. And then a general rule of thumb for keeping in touch with people overall is to check in every, you know, once a month, once every two months, depending on how active you are in your search, you can send them an article, update them on a connection that they made for you, send them an updated version of your resume, just to kind of stay in touch. Those are reasons or ways that you can um, get in touch with them again. And this is a general thank you email template that you can use top and bottom, and then something like thoughtful, re related to or relevant to the conversation, um, that was especially useful to you that will help you moving forward and an action step that you're committing to, so to speak, from that conversation. That's a really thoughtful thank you email and it will make a good impression. Um, and then finally, our last tip number five is to stay organized. And here's the deal with networking. We said this a little bit earlier. It takes more time and it takes longer um, to put the effort in to finding a job this way versus just you know put, posting your resume on a job board, et cetera. And it's really important to stay really organized when you're conducting your informational interviews because you need to track and keep track of what their contact information is, when you met with them, what was said, referrals that they gave you, if any, and what you need to do next with that person because you're gonna start to forget if you're doing this correctly and talking to multiple different people in any given week, for example. It's a good idea to keep your sheet updated at least once a week. I like Excel just because I think that's easy because you can have things in different columns and in different tabs, but whatever works best for you, you just wanna make sure you take really good copious detailed notes about 
what is going on with each person and what you need to do next. And Diana, if we can do this second poll, I think we have this loaded up. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But one of the things that we wanna suggest is that people have like a weekly schedule and goals, for example, for networking. So it's not just, okay, I'm gonna update my resume, I'm gonna attend this event, but they say, for example, I'm gonna um, make five new connections this week on LinkedIn and conduct two informational interviews. If you've got a weekly schedule and goal, you're gonna be much more successful and effective because you've got numbers to hit, you're tracking things and it's not just kind of all over the place, if you will, okay? so. Having a weekly schedule that is outlined even better in your Excel spreadsheet can be incredibly effective to help you with that. All right, so let's go ahead and move to our Q&A and we'll give people a moment. And while you're thinking about questions, I've got a heater going in my office and I just need to turn it off a little bit. We were talking at the beginning about the crazy weather in Atlanta. It's like freezing in the morning and then um, gets warmer later. And um, Diana was saying that happens in her neck of the woods as well too. So we'd love it if as a starting point before we go today, you would write down one action step that you will take in the next week to conduct more effective informational interviews. It could be as simple as I've already got some set up, I need to prepare my questions. Or <clears throat> I'm realizing I'm not staying in touch with people as much as I should, or in a timely fashion, I need to work on that. It could be that um, you want to join the alumni group. Horned Frogs Connect is in um, the chat box there. It could be that you need to update and search engine optimize your LinkedIn profile so that people can find you a little bit more easily. And when you go on these informational interviews, your LinkedIn profile is up to date because that's the first thing that people are going to look at after they meet with you a lot of times too. So any questions? before um, we start to wrap up for today. And Diana, is anything that you wanna ask or anything that you wanna announce before we go to, just in case we give people a couple more minutes to think of any questions? Um, I did get some questions sent to me. Uh, do you want for me to share those? Yeah, okay, that's so, so we have, how many informational interviews do you recommend conducting for a career change? Good question. I would say it depends on how quickly you want to make your career change, um, like what your goal is and your timeline. But if you're trying to figure out, for example, <clears throat> if this new job is the right job for me or the right next career path, it's a good idea to talk to at least, I would say, like between seven and 10 people to get kind of broad strokes of what that job is really like. You want to have enough that you're starting to see like similar answers and themes in the answers people are giving you, because then that tells you, okay, I'm covering my bases. I'm hearing the same thing. Um, okay. So we've got a couple of questions that came through in the Q and a box. So one person mentioned, never thought about question, sending questions beforehand, but I love that. Awesome. Glad that's a good takeaway. Definitely going to implement that as well as the weekly goals. That is so great. And please know that when you send the questions, um, it's just giving them an example. Like you, there may, may be other questions that come out, et cetera, but just having those kind of buttoned up like that is really good. And you can even say, these are the questions I'd like to ask. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, I'd love to get any other advice on other things as well. Another question, and let me just say answer live, so get that one. Okay, another question, does your company recommend anything related to using a headhunter? This is a really good one too, thanks for asking. So uh, two things to say related to headhunters and recruiters. So the larger recruiting firms um, that are nationwide, like Corn Ferry, Robert Half, they tend to work with a little bit more of the executive level searches. Um, and so if you're at that level, they're great. They can be very helpful, et cetera. What I tend to recommend is the second piece of advice is to try to find re recruiters or headhunters that are local in your area because they might be a little bit more responsive to you, have a better sense of what's going on in your industry locally as well. 
Um, and just remember that headhunting firms, they are not paid by you. They're paid by the company who has the open position. And so while there are some fantastic recruiters out there that really care about getting people into the right fit, for some of them, it's kind of like sales and they're just trying to find someone to get in that seat because that's how they get paid. And I, I please don't like, I hope there's aren't any recruiters on the call. Please don't be offended by that. I just know from experience that, you know, just like anything else in any profession, um, rem keep in mind that they are working for you. Like they want to get you into the right fit and they want you to get the job, but you also need to be your own best advocate is I think the best way to say it too, because they're technically at the end of the day, working for the company to get someone that's good for them. Another question is there was a reorg while I've been out on parental leave. I've heard from colleagues, it's not a good environment. I'm sorry about that. Is it okay to do these informational interviews while out on parental leave? Absolutely. I think that's absolutely reasonable. Um, and if it comes up what you're doing right now, it's completely okay to say um, that I'm on leave right now. My start date again is back You know, on this date, whatever it is. So absolutely, I see no problems there with that at all. Another question is, um, if I was laid off, is it okay to wait for recruiters to contact me? I don't want to apply to a bunch of jobs that are posted because they have to be in waste time. Oh, yes, I get it. Waste time when they have an internal candidate. So um, this is a tough one because a lot of times you cannot tell if they have an internal candidate and you're not going to be sure if it's actually a real job that they're posting. Um, in some cases, you can tell if it's like a weird phone number or the job description doesn't make sense. In that case, you can tell it's, you know, something that's not real. Um, but I, I honestly, I wouldn't wait for recruiters to contact you. I would be doing the things that we're talking about today, because if you just wait for people to contact you, what if they don't, and then you're already a month out and you don't have any opportunities lined up. We always tell people we want them to be as assertive as possible. <clears throat> and I get it about the not wanting to waste time in an interview if they already have an internal candidate. But what we tell people is it's interview practice. And we would rather have people have a few practice interviews under their belt before they get to that job that they really, really want. So in some cases, it could actually work out for you because it enables you to fine tune and hone things down. And I apologize, there's a question next here about the LinkedIn guide. So the LinkedIn guide that we have, um, that it's $20. You can just email me about it if you want more info. <clears throat> but it's tips and tricks to get in front of um, employers and recruiters, what to say to them, how to find people that are hiring that may not be advertising that, et cetera. So it's like ways to kind of leverage LinkedIn more effectively, tips and tricks to use it for your job search specifically and for branding yourself too, but mostly for job search purposes. Next question, these are great. Do you recommend using the email script for informational interviews in a LinkedIn message when you send a request to connect? This is a great question. <clears throat> and I've had people tell me kind of two different things on this. Um, I think that my recommendation first would be to ask them if they're willing to connect first and say, we are in similar industries or I'm a fellow alum and just have a reason why you want to connect in that first message. And then after they connect with you, asking for that time and in informational interview, because then you kind of know that they're more willing to possibly give you time if they have accepted your connection request. The other thing that's a little bit tough with the LinkedIn box to request to connect to is it doesn't give you that many characters. And so you can't say as much as you would like to um, in there too. This is a reason why though, um, unlimited messaging and more connection requests is why we recommend LinkedIn premium. In the past years ago, I used to say, don't bother, it's not worth it. They've made it worth it these days. You get a lot more tools, um, leverage in your search resources, all of that, that the premium version of it is worth it. And another question is how to handle periods of non-employment related to family health problems. 
So I would be referencing this on your resume and on LinkedIn. And I think it's okay in an informational interview to just mention, I've been taking a leave of absence from work for you know several months or whatever. You don't have to be exactly specific about it if you don't feel comfortable doing so um, to take care of an aging parent or due to family issue or illness in our family, um, looking to get back into the workforce. So you can say something like that on your resume and on LinkedIn. And when you're talking with people, I think people are much more understanding these days about those types of situations because we've been in the same boat, whether it's related to COVID, um, people change jobs a lot more than they used to in the past. There's just a lot of like different things that go on now in the workforce. So um, just reference it like as a line item on your materials so that people know what you have been doing and why versus having it be something that they're wondering about and uncertain and just a gap sitting there. These are really great ones. Um, so I think we explained everything on this last slide. As a reminder, you will receive a copy of the recording um, from today. And if you'd like the slides, the link is there just in case anyone joined a little bit late. Um, and Diana, I think we're good because we've covered all the questions at least so far. Okay, sounds good. Um, Holly, thank you again for another wonderful webinar session. I know this will be very helpful for a lot of people that want to have successful informational interviews. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with uh, what Hallie mentioned. And um, we appreciate your time. And thank you again, Hallie and Terrence. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Go Frogs. Thanks, everybody.